So I am a youngest sibling. Now, the way I say that sounds a little bit like a confession. And truth be told, it kind of is. You see, those of us who are youngest siblings know that being the youngest is a position of privilege. We got away with stuff. And incidentally, that's as far as my confession is going to go this morning. And we got away with stuff in part because our older siblings had suffered much. They had worn our parents down for us. So on the screen here is my family, this, my two older brothers, my two stepbrothers, and my stepsister, and I'm the youngest of all of them. I'm the, the good-looking one in the picture. Okay, I'm the, the good-looking one in the yellow shorts, the second from the right, with Curious George on my shoulders. By the time I came along, curfews, well, they were bendable. And permission to do things was a little bit more easily granted. And bad grades in school, or lackluster grades anyway, were more graciously tolerated. I think my parents were just tired. Yes, I have a lot in common with Curious George. He was a good little monkey, but always very curious. And best of all, I was rarely, rarely blamed for my impish mischief that I caused. After all, there were five others who were supposed to be more mature and more responsible than I. Yes, life was good. But there's also another side to being the little brother. When push comes to shove, well, you're just the little brother. When it came time for the family road trip, and this was our family car, guess who had to sit on the hump? That would be me. Now, if you're too young to know what I'm talking about, in old cars in the 1970s, the back seat was like a big, long bench. And in the middle, there was this raised ridge that ran down the length of the car. And that's where the drive shaft ran from the front to the back. And the youngest kid had to sit there in the middle between his older siblings with his feet propped up on the hump. So we would all pile into our family's pea green soup Chevy Impala station wagon with its pea green soup faux leather vinyl bench seats. We were all secretly a little bit jealous of our friends because our station wagon didn't have that wood paneling on the outside. And now there was no air conditioning to speak of, or at least it didn't reach to the back seats very well. And so on a hot summer's day, your legs would stick to that hot vinyl. And everybody wore those short, tiny gym shorts back then, so your whole leg would stick to that vinyl. And because I was the youngest, I was shoved into the worst seat, the dreaded middle seat, between my tormenting older brothers, with my feet propped up on the hump, because my spindly little legs were not welcome on the left and on the right where my siblings sat. No, life was not good. Well, I, I take that back. There was one seat that was even worse to sit in, and that was on the front bench seat between my parents, because that seat was generally reserved for whoever was in trouble at the time. And as I've already explained, being the youngest, that was rarely me. Now, this is how I went careening through my childhood, poked and prodded, shoved and squeezed, but always deeply loved. 
I learned so much from my siblings. They taught me about justice, about fairness, about kindness and mercy, and about humility. Okay, perhaps a little too much about humility. When I was a child, justice meant somebody sticking up for me when that bully came around in the middle school locker room. Justice meant being able to score the goal even when my coach didn't believe in me. Kindness meant loving me, letting me have the window seat or welcoming me in even when I was intolerably shy. And humility meant standing on a mountaintop or at the edge of the ocean or staring into the starry sky and feeling oh so very small. It meant being humped, uh, tumbled by a large ocean wave and being powerless to overcome its might or being tumbled by the weight of my middle school emotions, powerless to come up for air. Now the scriptures don't tell us, but I bet the prophet Micah was probably a youngest sibling as well. I say that because he writes like someone who has a certain life perspective that youngest hood endows you with. After you've been squeezed and needed enough times, you start to develop an innate sense of justice and fairness. But being youngest was by no means being the least. And certainly not in Micah's case. God gave this minor little prophet an outsized role in the Old Testament. In this short seven-chapter book, Micah predicted the Assyrian conquest of the northern kingdom Israel at a time when it was prospering and the destruction of its land was far from people's minds. He predicted the Babylonian conquest and exile of the southern kingdom of Judah at a time when it was prospering. And the idea of the destruction of God's holy city was laughable and perhaps even blasphemous. And he foretold the birth of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, in Bethlehem long before anyone knew what that would even mean. And are you familiar with the phrase beating swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks? You guessed it, that's from Micah as well. And then there's chapter 6. Some scholars have dubbed this chapter the Magna Carta of the Old Testament prophetic theology. Micah's definition of true religion. So who is this mighty prophet Micah? In the Old Testament, your lineage was everything. Important figures were almost always named such and such, son of, and then whoever the important person is that they are the son of. This tracing of family lines gives social status, land rights, inheritance rights, political power, and so much more. Micah, however, is presented simply as Micah of Morasheth, a small frontier town on the southwestern flank of the, of the kingdom of Judah. This means that he was probably from the peasant class, were at the very least not of noble birth. He understands the poor, the oppressed, the forgotten, and the marginalized because he probably grew up among them. He's a country boy with a healthy distrust of the big city, Jerusalem. Now, as I mentioned, Micah begins his prophetic activity during a time of great prosperity in Israel and Judah. Now, when I say prosperity, what I really mean is prosperity for the rich, for the privileged, the landowners, the connected. This prosperity was gained on the backs of the poor. The income gap between the rich and the poor was enormous. The disparities between the urban wealth 
and the rural subsistence poverty was staggering. Economic inequalities, class distinctions, social injustice, corruption, and greed among the political and religious leaders, they were rampant. And so Micah became a social justice prophet, speaking God's truth and power to the powerful and the elite and lifting up the poor. Micah had little patience for the hypocrisies of the political and religious elite and their duplicitous ways. Instead, he envisioned a different sort of relationship between God and God's people, a relationship not built on rules and rituals, but based on the heart. Micah was by no means the first leader or prophet to demand justice on behalf of the poor or to prophesy the downfall of a sinful nation that had abandoned fairness and, and justice. Micah was, however, notable for his concise, direct, and timely proclamations. If we look a little closer at our passage in Micah today, we'll see that God is leveling a legal charge, a lawsuit, if you will, against Israel. Scholars would call this a covenant lawsuit. God is charging Israel with breaking the covenant between God and God's people. Such lawsuits are also seen in other prophets, such as Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea. And one thing is for sure, you don't want to be on the wrong side of a lawsuit from God. God starts in verses 1 and 2 by summoning the defendants and the witnesses. The people of Israel are on trial, and all the earth is to bear witness, even the mountains themselves. The purpose of the trial is not God's desire to impose judgment, but rather God's desire to restore the breach in the covenant that has caused the Israelites that was caused by the Israelites' sin and selfishness. One might look at this as one of the first cases of restorative justice. In verses 3 through 5, God lays out some historical examples of God's mercy and provision, demonstrating that God was not the one who broke the covenant. The people were. And now we come to verses 6 and 7, and there an unnamed arbiter pleads Israel's case, asking what sort of sacrifices will please God. The problem is the arbiter is turning to legalism with a hint of sarcasm and a dose of hyperbole as well. Well, what God really wants is heart change. It's kind of like when you're little and there's a broken vase on the floor and your parents want an explanation. After ignoring your protestations that the vase broke on its own, you come up with this sorry alibi. Well, we were playing ball and my brother bumped into me and I bumped into the table and it shook the lamp and the lamp pushed the vase. Mom, it wasn't us. The vase fell over by itself. We didn't touch it. God wasn't much more impressed with the arbiter's legalism than your mom probably was with yours. What God and your mom were looking for was a little bit of contrition. God could care less about the Israelites' sacrifices because there hadn't been any heart change. Remember what the people of Israel were guilty of in the book of Micah, abandoning the poor, oppressing the vulnerable, corruption, greed, injustice, hard-heartedness. Empty sacrifices amounted to little more than trying to purchase God's forgiveness. No, something quite different was needed here. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. As we continue in our sermon series, The Walk, Five Practices of the Christian Faith, today's topic is service. 
Now, the reason for the long lead-in is that it's far too often that we want to jump into service without doing the difficult heart work first. Often it is easier to just do something than to actually slow down and love someone. It feels good to serve and to care for others, and it should feel good. I believe God wired us that way. But service should never be done for the sake of bargaining with God, to seek God's approval, or even to make ourselves feel better. If we do that, we've got it all backwards. You see, service isn't about us, and it isn't about earning God's favor. Our Ephesians passage today makes it abundantly clear that we don't earn our way to God through our works. Rather, as Micah reminds us, service begins with justice. Justice means setting right what is wrong, defending the weak, standing up for the vulnerable and the marginalized. It means walking, with, it means walking in another's shoes. It means acting honestly, dealing fairly with everyone. In order to offer this kind of justice, we must treat everyone with true dignity. And dignity comes from seeing others as equals, as just as valuable to God and just as deserving as we are. At first blush, we might simply shrug this off as quite simple enough. But do I really see everyone as equally deserving of God's love as I am? I've been going to church every Sunday for years. I go to Bible study, I sing in the choir, I put money in the offering plate every time I come. Surely I've earned just a little bit of God's favor. I know you play those games in your mind as well, just as I do. And so did the arbiter in Micah's lawsuit. But it's only when we stop puffing ourselves up and letting God change our heart that we can truly serve. You and I are no more and no less valuable to God than anyone else. If we want to serve God and others, we must act justly. If we want to serve God and others, we must love kindness. And I'm not talking about kindergarten kindness here. My wife works in a kindergarten class, and she often reminds her little friends to be kind to each other. And yes, being kind is a good start, but the Hebrew word here for kindness is chesed. The meaning of chesed is about far more than being nice. Chesed is a covenant kindness. It's more often translated into mercy or goodness. The connotation is that to be good to others comes without expectation of that goodness being paid back. If justice and dignity are the foundation on which service is built, chesed or covenant kindness, is the very heart of service. Chesed is the sort of love that God has for us. It's holy, covenantal love. God's love does not require for us to love God back first. God's love is undeserved. Indeed, chesed is the foundation of the New Testament idea of God's grace an undeserved gift freely given in Jesus Christ. And here again, we need to be careful. We serve others not because we have grace to offer them, but because God has grace to offer them, and to us as well. It's only when we see those we serve as our equals before God that we can offer them true kindness. And this is where God's final command comes in. 
to serve others, we must first walk humbly with our God. Now, lest we take this commandment lightly, we must recognize that in the entirety of the Old Testament, only three people are said to have walked with God. Walking with God suggests a total commitment. God doesn't want our offerings and our sacrifices. God wants you, and God wants me. Justice, kindness, humility. When I was a child, justice meant sticking, somebody sticking up for me when I was attacked by that bully. Kindness meant welcoming me in, and humility meant being overcome by the vastness of God's creation. As an adult, all these things are still true. Only now I see God's hands in these things, and I see Jesus as God's answer. Jesus is God's chesed, God's covenant kindness, God's unmerited gift for us. If I want to serve and love my neighbor, I must first fall in love with my Creator, the Creator of justice, the giver of kindness, and then I must walk humbly with my God. Service is not just things that we do. Service is a response to God's love washing over us like a mighty river. Your church does a lot of service in our community. We feed the homeless. We provide clothing and household items, toys and diapers. We care for refugees. We walk alongside immigrants. It's easy to find ways to serve at Centerville United Methodist Church, and I urge you to do so. But before we rush in, let us stop. Let us first be overwhelmed by God's love, because only then can we freely share it with others. Walk humbly with your God. Amen.